right, it's one minute past. I know some people might be joining, but we'll at least get started and kick off. Um, hi, everyone. It is good to see you. Um, if you can have your cameras on, that's great. Totally understand if you don't want to. It's been a long day and their Zoom fatigue is real, so totally understand that. But would love, um, this is an interactive session. session. So would love if you could in the chat or if you wanna come off mute, you can. Um, share your name, district role, and what is one word to describe how you're feeling coming into today's webinar? And we um, can get started off with Crystal as she put it into the chat. Um, and she's from the Office of Innovation and she's feeling pumped because we had some music coming on, right? Music is always a good, a good one. Awesome. Seeing some names come in, love to hear your role and describe one word um, of how you're feeling coming into today's session. And Crystal, I am recording this, correct? That is correct. Okay, I started to, and then I was like, ooh, I gotta, yep. go. okay. That is correct, and then we'll send it out to anyone who wanted to be here today but couldn't make it work. Awesome, and I'm seeing some people feeling ready for today, excellent. Well, let me go ahead and start recording then so I don't forget that or at least start again. Um, and some people are coming in. So um, Crystal, actually, before I start recording, or it is recording, so never mind. Yeah, um, it, it is. I'm going to actually make you a co-host. So if people are coming in, um, I have to like allow them in and that way you can do that part. Perfect, you got it. Awesome. And... Throughout this, if you have any questions, just let us know. We'll pause, make this a conversation. This is really for you. So what it's going to help you move forward. So just let us know. And um, that's how we'll, how we'll roll. So let's get started. Hi, Marsha, we just did a check-in today. How are you feeling today? She wasn't ready for me. You're on mute. Yes, yes I can unmute myself. That may help. I'm great. Thank you for asking. <laughs> All right, well, we'll get started. My name is Jill Thompson and I'm with Education Elements and I will be your facilitator today. In the um, chat, I have um, dropped in the uh, slides for you all. So if you wanna follow along, you can, or if you wanna go back to them later, at least you have a copy of the slides. But again, Crystal just shared, we're recording this. And so you will have the recording as well that you can refer back to. Um, I'm on Twitter, so if you are on Twitter, love for you to connect, share lots of great resources there, and it's a great way to stay connected in between, in between sessions. So today we have some two big goals. The link did not work. Let's try that again. I think it's because there was an extra little dash at the end that I, user error. Um, so we have two big goals that we're going to do today. First, we're going to um, participants will learn about um, specific instructional models that can be used in phase from distance learning, and that's really thinking about concurrent teaching, thinking about um, how you can stream, all different ways of thinking about instructional models, and then you'll be able to walk away with some resources and things to be thinking about as um, we are starting. So the very first thing that we really um, help. Um, when we work with teachers and districts is really thinking about how, what things do you need to think about when you're phasing in different considerations. A lot of teachers are already just told, hey, this is how it's going to be, but you still want to think about these three main components. And that is lesson complexi complexity, really thinking about multiple lesson, ver lesson versions and instructional opportunities to meet all students' needs. The flexibility for students, which is the system designed to let students' families get the equitable support and flexibility they may need. And then the technological ped uh, pedagogy or capacity and really thinking about stakeholders. Do they have the devices? Do they have the training? Do they have some of those requirements? Oftentimes we make a lot of assumptions where we say, well, we gave them a device, but that doesn't mean they necessarily have internet or sometimes um, I've worked with some districts in Arkansas that are rural, and they gave them a device and a hotspot, but that hotspot has nowhere to connect to. And so that's something also to be thinking about um, when we're thinking about these different components. 
So we're going to um, go deeper dive into each one of these and we're going to talk about what this looks like. But as we're doing that, I would love to hear in the chat from you all just a self reflection. Is there evidence this is true versus do we want this to be true as we're going through some of these? So I just shared a great assumption with you all where, you know, yes, we gave devices and we gave hotspots, but it doesn't mean the kids can still get connected. So um, that's something I want you to keep like in the back of your mind as we're going through some of these um, some of these components, because oftentimes we make assumptions and that's where um, we can we can tend to go a little bit astray um, from what our students do really need. So the first one is lesson complexity. And like I talked about, it's really the multiple lesson versions. And so some things to think about are teachers are comfortable creating synchronous and asynchronous versions of the same lesson. We find that a lot of teachers need more professional development around this and more supports and what that could look like. Or what does it look like if we do this lesson synchronous? What could it look like asynchronous? So an example could be we're looking at instructional models and designs. We're thinking about station rotation, flipped classroom, but then we're also thinking about those instructional models such as asynchronously, such as choice boards, playlists and pathways, and how those can work together so that you um, as a teacher can um, do what we call concurrent teaching, working synchronous and asynchronous. So concurrent teaching for us um, is really having some students maybe um, in your classroom face-to-face, -face, but then you're also teaching some students virtually at the same time um, and what that really looks like. Or this also could be completely virtual too. I've revealed a couple at a time there. So um, making sure teachers are invested in giving students choice in how they learn and demonstrating mastery. So if as you are a teacher, really think about that choice. Oftentimes teachers think they have to give them lots of choices, but really it comes down to two choices so that you can start having that intrinsic motivation and that student engagement. When we talk to teachers that are doing virtual learning and or concurrent or hybrid, lots of different ways, one of the things is that they talk about is really what does student engagement look like and how can I build in more student ownership? And one way to do that is through providing choices. Now, when you're thinking about choices or, or demonstrating mastery, you still wanna think about what your end goal is. So if you know mastery needs to be X, then you need to make sure that your choices are going to meet that what mastery looks like also, um, a lot of teachers say, well, I give them two choices, but they always pick the easiest one. That's human nature. We always pick the easiest one too when given choices. So think about making sure you have the same rigor and relevance for those choices to be able to um, meet the students' needs, but also build in that intrinsic motivation. So another thing is making sure teachers can create different learning pathways for students based on entrance, relevance, or learning modality. So really thinking about how can you build this in so that you are meeting with your students and being able to add in some of that choice that they like or some of the interests. Now, this does not mean that every student needs to have their own lesson plan and their own pathway. You still should be using the standards as your foundation, but then thinking about how can you add in some of that interest? Maybe it's through a book choice. Maybe they're interested. Maybe you're, you're doing a pathway around literacy and you're trying to um, really see if the student understands main idea. So then giving them the book choice of something that they're interested in. So maybe it's sports or maybe it's horses, but then they're reading something that they're interested in, but you're still getting demonstrating that learning of understanding the main idea. And so that's how you can bring in some more of that interest and relevance for them. Before we go into the next one of, um, with flexibility, I just wanna pause there. You can come off mute if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat, but I do wanna just give you a couple minutes as you're thinking through some of these components of lesson complexity. I'm also a teacher, so I'm good at wait time. All right. I also know that sometimes you think of questions after you go on and move to the next slide. Chat is always here. You can come off mute and say, wait, I thought of something. Totally fine as well. So the next one we're taking a deeper dive into is flexibility for students. 
And this is really thinking about um, the systems that we designed to let students and families get equitable support and flexibility and what that really looks like. And so some things we want to think about is the consistency and critical components of almost every conversation. And that means making sure that um, you are sharing information multiple ways and multiple times. Oftentimes, um, when we're talking to teachers and, and school principals and district leaders, they say, oh, we've communicated that. And when we ask them, how did you communicate that? They'll be like, oh, we shared it on a connect ed. Or they might say, oh, we shared it in an email. Well, research shows that um, we actually need to be um, hearing a message about 17 times. So we um, inform districts and teachers to really think about it and we say three by three, share the message three different times, three different ways. So maybe it is a connected, then it is a um, newsletter and it is a email so that they're seeing it three different times, three different ways. And so whichever way works best for them, they get that information. And it's more equitable if you have different um, ways of sharing that message because some people might not be signed up for Connect Ed. And so then making sure that you have it two other ways, you um, have that more equ equitable way of, of having that conversation and that communication. Um, teachers and leaders creating that flexibility for students and families. We'll show you a couple ways of what that can look like, but really thinking about um, when you're setting it up that a lot of times families have more than one child. So thinking about what that's gonna look like for the family when they're home or when they're hybrid or concurrent teaching um, and what you can do about that and thinking about ways that you can support them so that they feel included. Um, I know recently was working with a, a district in Tennessee where we met with the parents to help them learn just Zoom and thinking about the system so that they could then help their child. They got on, learned how to change the background. So if they didn't want their house in the background or you know whatever was in their background, they could then have this background for them so that they could feel more comfortable. Um, little things like that that are building that communication also building that flexibility for students so they feel more comfortable, but then also with that, also um, building that relationship with parents too. And then the last one to really think about is the amount of um, the amount um, of supports that changes depending on the students' needs. So um, you know that some students might need some more supports than other students, and thinking about what that can look like providing space to have um, those social emotional learning needs met. We know that if we do not have um, Maslow before Bloom, students are not gonna learn, right? And so having some open spaces where you are encouraging them to come off mute, having smaller group discussions, one-on-one -on -one times, um, I've also had teachers do like older for older kids, maybe a coffee chat where they just come in and they're just chatting, having their coffee in the morning and just um, a time where it's no, no structure, but just kind of sharing because we don't have a lot of those downtime anymore where we might've saw kids in the hallway and had those chats, or we might've, you know, talked to them in um, the cafeteria. So having like lunch buddies where you're just saying, hey guys, I'm gonna have lunch from 11.30 to 12.30. You're more than welcome to join me on the Zoom if you want, and then you're there. Um, and that's creating those systems that are helping to be more equitable, but also supporting um, students with their needs, especially that social emotional piece, um, which is, we know, very important. So last, thinking about the technology. Um, so districts using a learning management system is really important to centrally house and deliver instructional resources. I can't tell you enough about having a learning management system. We know that Arkansas has provided um, some resources or learning management system for you all and some districts use it, some by their own, Canvas, whatever it is. I will say a lot of teachers ask me, what about Google Classroom? Technically, Google Classroom is not a learning management system, but it is still a good place to start. Um, the difference between like a Google Classroom and a learning management system is like having um, ice cream and then having a Sunday, right? There's a lot more bells and whistles in a learning management system with grading, with communication, with notifications and things like that. Um, but 
Sundays are perfect, or I mean, I, just having ice cream is perfectly fine and just having Google Classroom is too, but something to be thinking about, especially if you are a teacher that you know you're gonna be teaching virtual for a while with your district, because a lot of schools are saying they're gonna keep virtual schools going for the next several years, like virtual schools aren't going away because some kids have flourished in this environment. And so if you know that, then that's something that you will want to um, really talk to your district about to make sure you have a learning management system so you have those resources all in one place and centrally housed. Students having access to devices and Wi-Fi at school and at home and making sure that they can go back and forth, that really helps just like uh, textbooks used to come back and forth. Um, that is something that's really helpful because now everything pretty much is on their device, just like a textbook was, you know, all their homework was in their textbook. And so that's something to really think about. And then again, sometimes we say, um, I was working with it actually a, a principal this earlier um, with um, another OIE member, Natalie. And one of the things she was talking about is like, I'm trying to find students and making sure that, you know, they're logging in and making sure I'm trying to find like students that are enrolled, but they're not enrolled in somewhere else. And some of the thing, some of the um, ways you can do that is going door to door and, and finding out if they have Wi-Fi or just asking if they have Wi-Fi, because if you don't ask, you won't know. And a lot of times people are embarrassed to say. And so that was one thing that we talked about. And she was like, you're right. I gave them devices, but they don't have, they might not have Wi-Fi. So that's something I can solve for. I can provide them a hotspot. And so just thinking um, about some of those things that sometimes we take for granted, especially because we're like, oh, we've been doing this since March, it's almost a, a year. And sometimes we still forget though, that that doesn't mean that all the kinks are figured out. Um, and so sometimes going back to those basics. And then teachers, making sure you're comfortable with the digital programs that your districts are asking you to use or that maybe that are offering. Um, and this is being advocates for yourself saying, hey, I'm, I would really like professional development around and then whatever the tool is, maybe it's Padlet, maybe it is uh, Dreambox or Lexia or Compass Learning, whatever it is, um, making sure you advocate for yourself for that professional development. I worked with a principal yesterday who was like, yeah, I provided them a couple professional developments. And I said, well, have you asked your teachers what they want besides just giving them professional developments you think they need? And he was like, no, he did a survey that day right after I got off the phone with him. And he wrote me back this morning and he was like, I need to get you back because they need all these professional developments that I had no idea. And so, um, yes, asking as a principal, if you're a principal or a leader, please ask your teachers what they need, but also teachers advocate for your advocate for yourself of what, what things that you need as well. So we're gonna think about um, a scale um, and phases of consideration and thinking about is there evidence is true. So there are gonna be different complexities, flexibility and technology as I start describing some of these next um, what we call instructional um, models. We'll go through four of them and you'll see that the complexity might be harder on one where the flexibility is a little bit lower and then technology is harder. And so you'll be able to start thinking about which one's right fit for you. And maybe it's a combination of some of these, which we have talked to other schools that maybe it's a combination as well. So the four approaches that we're gonna talk about with instructional models for uh, this kind of phase in, if you're virtual school, if you're hybrid, or if you're concurrent teaching um, is these four models. So you have what we call the wagon train model. And that's when you have in-person lessons, um, but the virtual students get it one or two days later. And we'll talk about what that looks like. High flex model where teachers are recording in-person lessons and then posting virtually for students that are virtual. Live streaming, which everything is happening in the classroom and at home at the same time. And then virtual school model and what that looks like where, virtu where students are virtual all day. So let's hop into the first ones. And then again, we're gonna tell you pros and cons and things to think about as, as you're um, moving forward. So the wagon train is probably the most popular. Um, and this is a, is a great way, especially when you're first starting, where you're teaching your in-school students a lesson, um, especially for hybrid, a lesson to students in school, and then transferring that lesson into an online format for students that they can access the, the next day or a couple days later so that you have that time. 
work out the kinks of it face to face with your kids, kind of see where they are. And then it helps them putting the video online. This is also be, you could also record your lesson as you're doing in person and then put the video online as part of that next, next day. And then that can help you pull small groups. This also works really well if you're doing a hybrid model where maybe your kids are coming in Monday, Tuesday, and then you have like Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, where they're asynchronous, where you can do some of this hybrid model of synchronous and asynchronous lessons. Um, a couple of days apart. So that way that you can pull small groups and really use your data data to know um, where your students are. Things to consider, think why this works well, it's consistent structure and expectations. Kids know exactly what's happening, where it's happening, where they have to go. Cons is there's a lot more planning on the teacher part because you're thinking about what it looks like online and then you're thinking about what it looks like face-to-face -face, or actually that's vice versa. You start face-to-face -face and then online. So those are some considerations to think about when you're doing the wagon train. As far as like complexity, it's, it's complex because you have to juggle um, both face-to-face -face and online lessons. Um, but for flexibility and technology, it's right in that middle part where it is um, doable and it does provide students with some um, flexibility with what, what they are learning. This next model is the um, high flex model. And this has been a favorite of mine. And some teachers get a little bit hesitant about it, but then once they start, they're like, oh, this, this model really does work. So um, the in-school students, teachers leading a lesson in school and at home recording the lesson. So students get to choose if they want to join that online lesson where they're seeing it or they, the teacher can then upload the video and the students at home can watch it at a later time. This is really great because pros is that it has choices for student. Cons is potential variable at how many students you have at home and um, online virtually so that you, know, you never know which students are coming, um, but you know that they're all gonna get the content. When you're thinking about flexibility, um, the complexity is probably medium. The flexibility is great for students though, especially for those families that have multiple kids and can't stream three or four um, lessons at a time. And so this way families can make a decision. Okay, Johnny, you can be on your online class virtually from nine to 10. But then your other lessons that are happening, you know, 10 or 11 or later, you need to watch those um, at a different time so that your brother can be on his 10 o'clock live session. So then you're not all streaming at the same time because a lot of hotspots and a lot of Wi-Fi families don't have the bandwidth to do that. And so this provides them with um, a lot of um, flexibility and choice. And then you always have things recorded. So for a teacher, it's, it's a very low lift because you're doing the same thing no matter what. You're teaching your, your lesson, you're recording a lesson, all you have to do is upload it, upload it to your learning management system and then check on those students just like you would have checked on them anyway if they were in your classroom. So the next model is a live streaming model and live streaming model is um, where all your in-students are just watching the live stream and they're doing it, everybody's doing it like in person, either virtually or um, face to face with the teacher. Pros is it's consistent structure and expectations. Everybody knows what they have to do. Cons, there's no choice for virtual students. They have to log in at that same time. Um, and you know that might not be best way for parents or for the student. And so that's something to think about. But there's also, you know, Complexity is pretty low. The flexibility is really low, um, but and the technology is higher because you do need to think about the bandwidth of live streaming. It takes up a lot more for your computer. It takes a lot more bandwidth um, of your school if you're at school recording. So those are things to think about too as you're thinking about which approach is best best for you. And then the last one is. Um, virtual school. And this is where students attend in-person classes full-time. And then they, there are students that are at home and there are two separate teachers. Um, and some districts have been doing this. Um, and then some, some districts can't do this because they don't have enough teachers to be able to do both. But we still want to give you this option. 
The pros of this is that it's consistent structure and expectations for both students that are in person and those students that are at um, virtual. Cons is there's more planning for the teacher because you don't have somebody that you necessarily can co-plan co with or do because they're teaching in person and you're teaching virtually or vice versa. And so it's a lot more independent work and you don't have like the grade levels that we're used to when we're planning because there are some that are face-to-face -face and some that are um, at home. And so there is that, there's not as much flexibility there um, when we're thinking about that. And so um, complexity, it's really low. You either are teaching in person or you're teaching at home. The flexibility, you have some because students can choose if they want to be in person or virtual. And that technology is in the middle because no matter if you're at home or in school, you should be using technology seamless and really thinking about um, blend, blended learning models to help with student engagement as well. So those are the four models and um, we are going to drop into the chat a resource for you um, that is just a little like assessment for you to take to kind of determine where you fall and like which baby model is best for you um, based off of kind of some of the things that we talked about. So it will open up a, a, a doc and there you can take this little assessment um, answer each of the questions. And if you get more A's and C's, then you can be like, oh, this one is best model for me. Or if you're, you know, more B's and C's and this model is best for me. So wanted to provide you that resource um, and uh, give you maybe a, um, I'm just going to play a short song to give you some time just to look at that and maybe take a minute to take that assessment. And then also give you some time to process because I said a lot in just a short time. And so just give you a little bit to uh, process time and then we'll open it up for questions. I'm gonna pause the recording too. <laughs> 